أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأن محمدا عبده ورسوله إن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save us from the hellfire and to protect us from Jahannam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us and to bless our time, our family, our business. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to continue giving us the ability to learn this beautiful religion and to follow the straight path. And the ability to pass down to our children, of, uh, offspring, grandchildren, our neighbor, our loved one. Insha'Allah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the sincerity practicing this beautiful religion, insha'Allah ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also to resurrect us all under his shade. In the day there is no shade. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring us to the Hawd of Al-Kawthar in the day of judgment to drink from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's hand from Al-Kawthar. Ameen, Ameen, Ya Arham ar rahimin Assalamu alaikum, one more time, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So I decided today we share three stories to just highlight how those early Muslim, the early Sahaba or Tabi'een, how they understood the core of Islam. You know, we talked a little bit before that the ruh, the spirit of Islam is different than Islam as, uh, you know, the five pillars of Islam as a practice. The most important part of the Islam is how your heart stand. Where does your heart stand? Where is your mind? Where is your thoughts? And this is how uh, Islam has to be to reside in your body and to, to run in your body wherever the blood run in your vein. And as Aisha radiallahu had described, the uh, attribute of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and his manner as khuluquhu al-Qur'an. So his manner and his attribute was al-Qur'an, or another hadith says, Qur'an and yamshi ala al-ard. He was walking Qur'an, subhanAllah. But today we see ourselves, we don't see it that way. We just see so many people of us, they practice the pillars and we see them practicing salat, or hijab, or salm, or everything. But sometimes we see the condition of our Muslim ummah, it tells us something wrong because it's not as, as flower and as fruitful as the early uh, nation of the Ummah, right? This Ummah or the first uh, uh, or the second, all the way to the Khulafa al Abbasiyin. And after that, we have al Uthmayyin, still, still Islam and the Muslimin were in a such powerful statement. But after that, we, you know, this past two, 300 years, we are doing very bad condition. So let's see how they understood. I mean, sometimes simple, simple stories we tell to our children, maybe bedtime we say yeah right sometimes this this story carries so much weight we ignore that and we focus on who said how they said what happened okay they went to he heaven good night that's uh, right so let's see how uh, simple these stories and how deep they understood islam as a practice and a behavior and a walking uh, on the ground as a believers and practicer of this Islam, right? So let's see one of the story very well known and he came to Islam uh, in the time of Mecca, which is a prosecution time. It was a very, very scary if anyone will announce and then will say, I am a Muslim. They will, it was even the Prophet ﷺ will tell them, keep it as a secret. If you accepted Islam, keep it as a secret. Very few people who could announce that they were accepting Islam, uh, like Hamza, for example. When Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib, he didn't hide. Why? Because Hamza is, is a personality. Nobody can step on his shoes. You know, he's a powerful, he's strong, just like Umar ibn Khattab. When he came to Islam, he came in the Kaaba, he said, whoever wants to fight Islam or kill Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, let them come and kill me first, right? So nobody dare get up or pick up a, a garbage and throw it on the top of the head of Umar ibn Khattab or Hamza, because they were a people of, 
uh, status and uh, they were scared of the people before Islam. So when they came to Islam, they, they were very powerful. Uh, they have their own community. They were ummah, they were nation by themselves, subhanAllah. But let's see who is Abi Dhar al Ghafari. So when we know Mecca is here and Medina is there, and there is like several uh, hundreds of kilometers between, right? Uh, there's another uh, huge tribe lived before between Mecca and Medina, right on where the caravan pass. Okay, the caravan pass. So this tribe was spread there. That tribe called Al Ghafar, Qabila Ghafar. But they were not business people. They were not like uh, having a good attribute nation of Arab, but actually it was the opposite. Because they live on very strategic position, any caravan come from Mecca and Medina to Bilad al-Sham, or from Medina to Mecca, then to Yemen, they will attack that caravan and they will steal if they find out that caravan really cannot defend themselves. We call them in Arabic Qutta Turuq. Yani they were thief. If they can, if they can take away the, your property, even if they have to kill you, they will do it. But of course, if the caravan big and have an army and a protector, they will be okay. We can't we can't do this daily job with them, right? So that's how Qabila uh, Tafar was well known. So one of this guy named Abidar, that's his nickname. Abidar never bowed down to idols, never liked the people of Mecca, how they worship these idols and believe in that. Even though he was not as uh, a behavior, he was a thief. He was just taking a chance of someone to beat him up and take their property and steal it, okay? But even though he did not bow down to idols because he, he will make fun of them. He will say, how could they worship, you know, something like that. Um, so in that time, he heard that there's a man in, in Mecca, in Mecca called Muhammad, the son of Abdullah from uh, Qabila Quraysh, uh, calling himself that he's, you know, calling people to worship one God. Stop, you know, doing anything with his idols. Stop being polytheist and come to worship the one God. So he liked the idea, but because he doesn't know anybody in Mecca, he never entered Mecca before. He's not a, a, a eloquent to go to talk a business or meet those leaders of Mecca. He asked his brother, his brother was a traveler. So he told them, why don't just pass by Mecca, meet that man, Muhammad, where they talk about him, he's a messenger and bring me some news about him. What kind of person he is? I wanna know that. So the brother, he said on my trip, next time I go, I do some business, I will do. So he came and he actually met Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he started asking people about the, at, uh, the, about, the um, uh, about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his reputation. So everybody talked very good about his reputation, but those people he will ask, they did not like the fact that Muhammad now, he invented a new religion. You know, other than the people, the Meccan people have this religion of worshiping the idolic religion. Uh, so when he came back home, he told his brother, all I know about Muhammad, that he's trustworthy. He says the truth, but people did not like his innovation. They think that this religion he came up with, it's innovation, something new. They never heard about this previously from their own fathers or forefathers, right? For 600 years, it was no religion in their time. It was no religion to call to worship to one God after Isa alayhi salam, no other prophet came. So they, they found it like Muhammad calling himself, he's a messenger of God. It was a little strange for them. So this is a talk, his brother came home, but Abidah said, you did not satisfy me. It did not satisfy me with that news. I want detail. I want to know what he's, uh, what he's talking about, what is the God that he's supposed to worship as a one God? What's the attribute of that God? What's the name of that God? What is that God? Where we can find that kind of God? The detail, he did not bring anything. So he said, you know what? I'm going to go by myself and I'm, I'm, I'm going to meet that person. So that's when Abidar came to Mecca. But because he's a stranger, totally never came to Mecca in his life, he doesn't know much people who live in Mecca. He didn't know Ali, he did not know Abu Bakr, he did not know Uthman, he doesn't know any of those people. So he's totally a stranger. Somebody will see him, they think he's just a Bedouin traveler. So he goes and he sit around the Kaaba and he just hang there. He has nobody. Remember back then they didn't have hotel, motel. You come, if nobody hosts you, 
<laughs> you're gonna sleep on the street like a homeless. So he comes and he stayed by the Kaaba and he waited for someone to come and start, you know, calling, uh, doing something unusual than other people who come and touch the idolic and worship, which he hated himself. So all he see, nothing really. But who come and pass by him? A young man called Ali, radiallahu anhu. This is a cousin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And he come to him, he said, oh, who are you? I never met you before. Then he goes, yeah, I'm a traveler. I'm here just for a short time. He goes, okay, if you need anything, let me know, I could help you. But he ignore, and Ali does not pray. He does not make tawaf. He does not show that he's practicing any religion yet, right? Yeah, everybody know Ali accepted Islam, but nobody's bothering Ali also. He's the son of Abi Talib, and he's a young boy anyway. So he goes back. Then he comes the second day, and he comes, and he sees the same man sleeping there. He slept there a night before. Now he's starving. He looks like he's hungry. So he brings him some food. He offers him, and he chit chat with him. But still, Abi Dhar wants to meet this Muhammad what they call about him Muhammad, and he wants to just explore him without Muhammad know who's he, right? So he asked Abidar, who are you? You just keep checking on me, you checked on me yesterday, and now you're back to me, who are you? He goes, I am Ali. That's all he said, I am Ali bin Abi Talib. So he, he does nothing and he just let him go. The third day he comes and still Abidar still there. And he goes, man, you're, your story is so strange. Nobody ever here come and stay and stay in, in this open space, which is too hot, no food, no bed, no pillow, no blanket, three days homeless. And unless you're so tired and you're so hungry, tell me what you want. He goes, no, I can't tell you, I can't tell you. But he goes, tell me, I, you know, you could trust me. I'm young boy, you could trust me. So he said, can you just tell me where is Muhammad? Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, he said, yes. He said, I cannot take you to him, but I'm going to walk away and you're going to meet me in certain area. And once you get there, then I'm going to change the path to the house where Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stay in secret to pass his da'wah. You're going to follow me there. He said, okay, I will do that. And then Ali, radiallahu anhu, as if he trusted this man, he really three days, you know, uh, tenting or sitting in next to the Kaaba, he couldn't have the chance to meet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he just follow, he follow uh, Ali bin Abi Talib in the secret path, and he bring him to Muhammad, and when he enter, he sit uh, side by side to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he tell him what brought him here, and he tell him exactly that he's really dare to hear from Muhammad directly, what is this religion he's calling of Islam? What is the God he wants him to worship? Because uh, I mean, anyway, he doesn't worship idols. So when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam invites him to this beautiful religion, to uh, uh, you know worship the one true God, the one who created the heaven and the earth, the one who is in his hand, everything, our fate and everything, the nar, adab al nar, the punishment and the reward, it's all in the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the God I'm inviting you. Immediately, Abi Dhar accepted Islam. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tell him, please keep it as a secret. So go home now. When Islam is, is, is time to be announced in, in uh, loud, and you will hear about this, then you and you know, whoever accept this religion from your family, from your tribe, you're welcome. You know, then you could spread. But right now, keep it secret for yourself even because people of Mecca that will kill you if they find out that you accepted Islam because you're a stranger anyway. You got nobody to protect you there. Abiza said, Wallahi, I have no fear from nobody. If they want to kill me, that let them kill me. He leave the house where he met Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He come around the Kaaba and he start screaming loudly, "Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad rasulullah." And then the people of Mecca said, "What? Sabata? You just left the religion of your for uh, for uh, father and you're just a stranger? How dare you can come from outside of Mecca, come here, spend th three days here, then finally we find out that you accepted the religion of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Muhammad is one of us and we reject him. We're not gonna allow you. We're not gonna allow you to accept this religion and then transfer 
this religion to your tribes and go ahead and all uh, uh, Rafar, uh, the, the Kabila of Rafar, the tribe of Rafar, they will accept Islam. So they attacked him. They attacked him and start beating him up, beating him up, beating him up. And every time he pick up his head and he can breathe, he call, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. So they beat him up so much, almost dying and bleeding, that Al Abbas show up. Who is Al Abbas? The uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. By the way, the uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam accepted Islam in secret, and he kept the secret for ten years, till uh, uh, the opening of Mecca, for a reason. And then Al Abbas, he came to him. He said, he he told everybody the kufar Quraysh, "What are you doing to a man? What are you doing to a man? What do you think his tribe will do to you if you kill this uh, the son of Al Ghafar?" Al Ghafar family are living right between the path of your caravans. So if you kill this man from this tribe, what do you think gonna happen with your business tribe uh, caravans? If it's gonna go from Mecca to Medina back and forth, do you think they're gonna let this blood go in vain? They will attack your caravan. They will take all your money and they will kill you all of you. You, you know, al akhiz bithar. They will take revenge. And uh, the people backed up and this way he saved him. He uh, took him home and he washed him, he nursed him, and after he you know, healed his bones, probably, it took him uh, whatever the time. So Abidar came back home and he accepted Islam. And from that time, after Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came to Medina, that's when also uh, Abidar and all his tribe accepted Islam, they migrated to the city of Medina after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa reached his destination after a few years, subhanAllah. So now, let's see, Abi Dhar al-Ghaffari became uh, a judge. Um, when he became a, uh, not really a judge, he was a wali. Uh, so he, he received, uh, after the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa after maybe in the time of Amr al-Khattab, it says, he became the wali, wali of one certain area. Uh, wali means like Amir of certain area. And in that tribe, there was a Bedouin traveling with his camel, and he passed through this garden of palms tree, and then the man was very tired. He sat down, he took a nap, but he didn't tie his camel. The camel started wandering in the garden and he started eating the grass, the fruit from the palm trees. And you know, the camel is hungry and he's eating and the owner of the camel was laying down by one under the shade and taking a nap, deep nap. The owner of the garden came and he saw the man snoring and he saw this camel damaging his garden. And then he went to him and he wake him up. He said, get up, what are you doing? You're a thief, your man has no thinking. What do you think? You let your animal wander in my garden and eat and you're sleeping? Leave my garden right now before I kill you and I kill your animal. Or I will take my claim to Sayyidina Amr ibn Khattab. He is the Khalifa who will give me my right. Then he told him, okay, okay, leave me alone. But my camel was hungry and I was very tired. I sat down, let's, let's animal eat some grass. I, I mean, he's just eating grass from your garden. He told him, no way, and they start fighting each other. So when the owner of the garden knocked down this Bedouin, uh, the Bedouin was, you know, being up, up with a stick he had. The, the Bedouin held a stone and he defends himself. He hit the head of this owner of the garden. When he hit the head, he fell down. And when he checked on him, he was dead. He killed him. He killed him. He didn't have the intention to kill him. He was defending, you know, himself, but it went to violence. And, you know, if he didn't kill him, probably he will get killed. When that happened, he tried to run away. When he tried to run away, uh, a person was looking, watching from far, and he saw everything what happened. And he ran to uh, the brothers of the owner of the garden, and he told them, go see your brother get killed. And this Bedouin man with his camel, he's running away that direction. So they came, they saw their brother dead, and they ran after the camel and the owner of the camel, they catched him. And they tie him up and they told him, you killed our brother, we're going to kill you. But we're only going to take you to the Khalifa. Uh, so they're going to come to Amr ibn al-Khattab to the city of Medina, but they have to go to the judge. So Amr ibn al-Khattab sent them to the judge. He said, whatever the judge, you know, judge will, will uh, reinforce the judgment. So when uh, 
the judge listened to the story of this Bedouin man. He said, is that true that you came and you allowed your camel to wander and eat from this garden, then you killed him? He said, yes, I did kill him, but I really didn't have intention to kill him. But, you know, he was trying to beat me up. He had the stick. He knocked me down. So I picked up a stone and the stone went to his head. So he died. So uh, he said, well, according to the story, you admitted that you killed him also. Now you have to be to get killed. You have to be killed. We have to kill you. And unless the family of this owner of the garden, right, forgive you and you could pay them the blood, you know, instead of, you know, get killed. Uh, so they asked, they asked the brothers, what do you want? You want us to kill him or you want him to pay you the price of the blood? They said, no way, we're not going to accept any money. Our brother died, he killed him, he has to be killed. He said, okay, the judge announced, and uh, you know, immediately they're going to reinforce the rule. He told the judge, please, 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 let me just give me one day, 24 hours. I have a lot of money to pay back to my uh, business partners. And I only have a, a, my wife and children. Uh, I have to tell them the story. And uh, they have to be prepared for me getting killed. And I have to pay back some people who, you know, I have to do some business before you kill me. But I promise I will return in 24 hours. But the judge looked. And to the brother, he said, would you accept that happened? They said, no way. What are going to let that? this man be doing? We don't even know where he live. If you leave, he will never return. <laughs> it's not like now, OK, we're going to put the handcuff on you. We're going to drive you with a police car. We're going to let you do what you do, right? And no, no way, no way. We're not going to let that happen. So the judge said, I'm sorry. We have to do what we have to do. He begged him. He said, please, anyone can give me kafala. I mean, can anyone uh, protect me and take my word and be the presenter, be my attorney, be the presenter of me? If I promise that I will come back now, just gonna give me if any anything happened, just give me one 24 hours. And then the judge asked, who will who will you know be the attorney of this person? Everybody looked at each other and said, we don't even know him. Who came? Al-Wali. Who? Abidar al-Ghafari, the Sahabi, the great Sahabi. He said, I will, I will take his place, give him time. If he does not come back. Ya Abidhar, you, you're a Sahabi. You're one of those, I mean, the only few Sahabi left. If this Bedouin man never returned, we have to kill you. Do you understand the consequence? He goes, of course. That's why I'm going to do it. Honest to God, Allah knows what's my, uh, my heart. I'm going to do it. I will, I will, you know, take the word of this man. If he does not come back, I will be the one whose neck will be in the, uh, under the sword. The man said, Jazakallahu khairan, I promise I will come back. In that case, the judge said, I'll give you two days. You have to do what you have to do. Two days by Salat al-Asr, if you don't come back, Abidur al-Ghafari will be killed in your place. The man left. He went to his wife, first of all, and he told her what happened. She said, oh my God, let's run away. How are you going to get killed? Are you sure you're going to go back and you're going to get killed? Who's going to raise these kids? My kids are young and I'm going to be a widow and now you, you're going to return all the money to all the people, you know, your business partner. We're going to be poor. We're going to be nothing. Don't do that. Don't do that. Run away, run away. But he said, no way. I'm going to keep the word, the promise I gave it to this man, Abidur al-Ghafari. I don't even know him. I'm going to keep that word. I'm going to just go ahead and take care of the business. So the man went to his friends. He did what he has to do, the transaction. And now the time is coming, ticking. Now two days by Salat al-Asr, the judge is there, Abidur al-Ghafari there, the brothers who they want to see, the Bedouin man dying is there, waiting. Okay, judge, let's do it, let's do it. Well, let's wait for the Bedouin man before the sun go down. If he's here, he's here. If he's not here, Abidur, sorry, Abidur, I mean, even Amr ibn al-Khattab will say, let the Sahabi go. We're not going to allow Sahabi Jalil, a great companion of Rasulullah to die in such way. And uh, the, the judge told him, we told you, Abidar, uh, don't you feel sorry now? Uh, this man who you, you 
agree to represent him. He's not here. So uh, don't you feel bad now you're going to die? He goes, now Allah, my heart will never change. I, this promise was between me and Allah. You are my witness. I am very happy. And if, if this is the way I'm going to die, this is the way I'm going to die. And he put his head down there and he said, go ahead, apply. Apply the rules and go ahead, kill me. Khalas, this man is not going to come. It's almost sun going down. And then while they left, uh, you know, elevated, they, you know, they called the man who was going to do, uh, apply the, 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 the rule, and he picked up his sword, and then a man running on his cabin, Allahu Akbar, please stop, please stop, I'm here, I'm here, the Bedouin coming. And then everybody stopped and looked at him, they said, oh my God, he's here, really, he's here. And then he said, I am so sorry, I am so sorry, I just have to do so many things. It just like the sun's still there. And how could you do that? Wait for me, wait for me. So he arrived and then they stopped everything. They said, Alhamdulillah, Abidar, get up. Abidar said, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, you are here. And then he said, you really want to die in my place? What made you to do that? What made you to do that? Then uh, Abidar said, what was that? Abidar said uh, one word. He said, uh, "I when when the judge asked who was to die in the place of of this man, if this man don't come back, he said, I said me Abidar because I thought we're gonna be in an era where there is dhab al wafa min al nas. People will say dhab al wafa. Nobody wants to protect the stranger. What's happening in this world? I mean, come on." You know, somebody has to have this good quality to, you know, to uh, believe in what this man is saying, even though he's a stranger. So for that reason, uh, you know, I, I, I promised and I, I, I was really willing to die in your place. Then uh, uh, said uh, the, the man, uh, the Bedouin man, he said, um, what made you, what made you to come back and, you know, to die? You know, you were going to die. What made you to come back? He said, uh, yeah, of course I'm gonna come back because people would think that it was not one person who can say the truth in this world. Even the man who promised that he's gonna come back in two days before the sun go down in front of a judge and in front of the righteous people, they will say, oh my God, he's so coward. He did not come back. So I don't want people to, to speak that way. So here I am, I'm willing to die. I deserve this death, I'm gonna die. In that minute, so when they picked up the sword to kill this Bedouin, the three brothers came, they said, judge, we want the freedom for this man. Let this man go, please don't kill him. They said, what? You are behind the story and you were just begging me to apply the rules. He offered you money and you didn't wanna accept money. Now you want him to live? They said, we don't even want the money, we want him to live. What made you to say that? They said, we say this because we will think people will say that we are in an era where people will say, my God, nobody pardon. So we pardon him. Alhamdulillah. This is the way they understood Islam. And this is how one human being, when they you know, behave a righteous way, become contagious. You know, the, the Bedouin was right. He came back, kept, kept his promise, even though it's a last minute. Abidur al-Ghaffari uh, accepted and he took the oath that he will take his place to die if he doesn't return, all right? And that's Islam, that's al-Wafa, that's al-Khair. There's a goodness in people, right? And then those people who they saw that, they said, no, we're gonna forgive him. You know, these people are, are, are too good to, to be called. So they were also a good, at the end of the day, they were also a good a forgiver. They, you know, they let this man go also to live. And that's the way really they understood Islam. You know, sometimes we take each other on the court. Some family member even, they take each other for a court. We, sometimes we don't even know what's the definition of pardon or forgiveness. Uh, sometimes, even if we can't forgive these people, maybe we curse them or we we make dua against them at night. You know, I, I heard so many people who they make dua against their family member because this and that or whatever story happened. Uh, and those are Muslim practices sometimes. So, uh, so the core of Islam is to understand Islam as al dinu al muamala. It's how you deal with each other. That is the deen. All of them did for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
That's one story. The second story, I'm gonna tell you about this rich man. He was a very wealthy and in the time of the Umay, uh, Umayyah. The, we talk a little bit about Al Abbasiyah. You remember when you talked about uh, Zubaida, uh, the lady who uh, we know her, this is Sahibat uh, al-Yad uh, al-Bayda, the one with the white hand from Al Abbasiyah time. But before Abbasiyah, almost 100 years was the era of Al Umayyah. In the seventh Khilafah of Umayyah, and this time, remember, Umayyah uh, started with the son of uh, Abi Sufyan. Abi Sufyan, the head, uh, uh, the governor of Mecca before Islam, and uh, when Islam uh, came to Mecca, and uh, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and Al Muhajirin returned to Mecca, that's when Abi Sufyan became uh, Muslim. But his son, uh, Muawiyah, he came to Islam at the age of very young age, like 16, 17 years old. He accepted Islam and he did Al Hijrah with Rasulullah. He is the founder of the Umayyah Khilafah right after uh, the death of Ali. We talked a little bit about that. From this era, from this time, a man named Khuzayma, he was a very rich, very businessman. You remember the uh, time of Umayyah, uh, I mean, mashallah, uh, the Muslimin, all of them were very wealthy, very rich, very successful businessmen. And Islam was spreading all the way uh, to the border of China, to south of France, and all north of Africa, almost uh, Islam spread that fast because in the time of Umar ibn Khattab, right after that, Uthman ibn Affan and Ali ibn Abi Talib, now in his time, Umayyah also, that's what happened. So, Khuzayma, this businessman, Khuzayma bin Bishr, his name, he became, he lost his business, right? Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. So when he lost his business, uh, he will, Pray every day. He will beg Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Oh, it's not only my money I lost. I must. I lost my partners. So when you borrow or your partner invest money with you, when you lose, you feel like you owe them at least the capital. You got to give them the capital. That's. That's a debt, debt consider. So he became only owning money to the Muslim brothers, and uh, he just. Uh, he couldn't just knock the the door of the Amir back then I, to the government in another world and tell them, hey, I need some help here because I'm, you know, he felt very embarrassed. Uh, he felt very shy to borrow money even again from the government, you know, local government or anything like that. So he started praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, oh God, you know, just open up doors for me and his wife will cry. Oh my God, what are we gonna do this? How are we gonna, you know, our business gonna come back? How are we gonna pay back these people and on and on and on. So one night, at the middle of this night, his door knocked. And when he opened the door, uh, this man will, you know, have mask, hiding his identity. Uh, he uh, give him, a bag full of coins, gold coin. And he said, this is for you. He goes, who are you? You just came here at the middle of the night and I can't even tell who are you. What is this bag? He goes, I know that you're in trouble financially. So this is fa'al khair. You know, we say fa'al khair. And you, uh, the, he used this word called jabir atharat al-kiram. Jabir atharat al-kiram means, jabir mean when something break, and you put it back together, that's jabr in, in, uh, in Arabic language. That's why uh, al-jabra, jabr mean you're trying to solve a problem. You have an unknown variable in an equation. And when you solve it, those steps, you call it al jabr right? That come from the Arabic word jabr. Jabir here, it's the one who heal if somebody break. So this man's heart, Khuzayma's heart was broken, his business broken. So this man, he called himself a nickname, Jabir. Atharat means when you fail, when you trip, your business broke, so you fail, you fell down. That's Atharat, Al-Kiram, but you're an honorable person. And really, Khuzayma was a very honorable, people loved him. That's why people trusted him in his business and they invest money in him. So he is one of the honorable, Kiram, one of the Kiram. Karam is, is generosity. Karam is full of generosity. So I am, my name is Jabir Atarat al Karam, like saying in Arabi, fa'al khair. I'm doing something good. You don't have to know who I am, just take this money. And, and he leaves. He throws the, the bag to him and he leaves. When he leaves, 
his wife said, who's that? What, what happened here? He said, oh my God, this is strange. I don't even know this man. He just called himself Jabir Atar al-Kiram. Okay, let's see what's in the bag. They open the bag, they find 4,000 dinar. It's just like millions of dollars today. Somebody just throw the money to your face? Go ahead, stand up on your feet and do this business again and take care of your debt. And of course, Khuzayma was very happy. So he reestablished his business. He paid back all this debt, uh, whatever he owned, and he was very, very happy. He always wished, you know, he can do good deeds just like the stranger did to him. In this time, uh, he traveled. Uh, well, uh, let's say that this Jabir Asarat al Kram, the, the, the man with the mask, he goes home. When he goes home, his wife, see her husband coming inside the house in the middle of the night and he has a mask on his face when he come inside he takes a mask and the wife tells me oh, what are you doing at the middle of the night and you leave oh you don't want the neighbor to know who you are or you're going to see your second wife you didn't even tell me okay one of us will always say if your husband leaves the middle of the night and he come home in sneaking in the house, right? <laughs> what are you gonna say? <laughs> so she started accusing him. What? Wow, definitely you have a second wife, you're hiding from me. She starts crying. He goes, nothing like that, ya Buthayna, Hernan Buthayna, nothing like what you're thinking. Believe me, trust me, I have to do something in secret. Please don't push me. Then he goes, Wallah, I, she said, I will beg your life. I will give you a hell. You have to tell me what you did. Otherwise, I promise I will keep you in secret. I will keep it in secret, but you have to tell me. Otherwise, I'm, I'm not going to make your life comfortable from now on out. You're doing things behind my back. So he said, you promise you're not going to tell anybody? She said, I promise I'm not going to tell anybody. She said, um, I went to the house of Khuzayma. You know, everybody started talking about Khuzayma's business. It went down, and his partner started seeking their money to have it back, but he didn't have it. So I gave him money. That's it. But I don't want nobody to know that's me. Why? He is the wali of that area. He is the head of that area. He's the governor. So he did this good in secret because he don't want even Khuzayma to know that yeah, the wali himself came, give me money. You know, how embarrassing is that? You promise you're not going to tell anybody? She said, I promise. So she kept secret, alhamdulillah. But now, now Khuzayma's business back, right? So now he has to travel all the way to Dimash, which is the capital, right? And he came to the uh, Al Khalifa. The Khalifa from Umayyah, that's why we talk about his name, Suleyman bin Abdi al uh, bin Abdul Malik. Suleyman bin Abdul Malik is uh, the Khalifa number seven in the wilaya of Al Umayyah. This is like in the uh, 94 of Al Hijrah, 94 years after the immigrant of Rasulullah. So Sulaiman said, Oh my God, uh, uh, what's his name? Khuzayma came to me. He was very happy to see him. And he, the Khalifa told him, I really heard about your business. Your business went down, bad time. Then Alhamdulillah, now you picked up. And how has that happened? Tell us, how could you just you know, come back so? fast and from your business dying. He said, Khalifa, thank you, but Allah and a person who saved my life, I don't even know his name, but he called himself Jabir Atarat al -Kiram. He knocked the door at night and he has a mask on his face, I don't know. Then Al Khalifa said, wow, we heard a lot about this person. So many poor people and so many people get help, but they don't know for, from this person. This person is always wearing the mask and he called himself Jabir Atarat al -Kiram. If you find out the truth, Al Khalifa said, let me know, I really wanna honor him. I really wanna you know, give him prize for the good things he's doing. Why he doesn't want us to know it anyway. But anyway, I'm glad you are here because he said, I'm gonna make you a wali of your area, your town. But he said, you have a wali called Akrama. He goes, it's okay, Akrama's time is almost over. You're gonna go take his place and takes my letter with you. That's how they used to do it, subhanAllah. He wrote him a letter, go there and go to the town, show the letter to the wali and he will step down and he will take over and you know everything will be fine. So uh, Khuzayma said, okay, since you trust me that much, 
and he came back home and then he went to Akrama, the wali, uh, in the government office and he showed him the letter from the Sultan, uh, the Khalifa, the successor, right? And he told him this is the story. He said, no problem at all. I will step down, down and go ahead, you take. So they have to exchange, right? He has to show him the finance. Most, most likely it's a finance and the things in the government because they established a system uh, in the time of uh, Omeya, I mean, the system was great. So when uh, Khuzayma checked the finance business, he find out that this man, Akrama, is short for 4,000 dinar. And he said, Akrama, I'm not gonna let you go home. Where is the 4,000 dinar here? You're shorted. This is the money of Baytul Mal. This is the finance of the believers, unless you bring me this money in 24 hours and we replace it, we put it back in the in the khazina, right? In the Baytul Mal, I'm not gonna let you go and I'm gonna put you in jail. The man was in Paris to tell him, hey, I saved your, your, you know, your life. I saved your business with that money. He, he, said, he said he's gonna keep it as a secret, right? He said, I don't have my own money, that big money, to bring it to you, but he said, I just want you to know that I saved people life with this money. I can't tell you who, I can't. He keep asking him, if you don't tell me whose life you saved and if it's worth it, we're gonna let you go. Otherwise, I'm gonna put you in jail. He said, go ahead, put me in jail and I won't tell you. So he put him in jail. Imagine, when he put him in jail, the second day, who come knock the, the door of the new Wali, the new Wali, new Amir, which is Khuzayma, this woman, Akram's wife. She goes, oh my God, my husband lost his government office. Now he's in jail for what? For the money he used to save your life? So she come to his house and he goes, uh, Khuzayma, oh, you're the wife of the Wali. You came to my house, so you're gonna cry. You're gonna show me that. How could you put the Wali in jail? She said, no, 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 no. I just, I'm here to tell you, Take it easy on Jabir Asarat al-Kiram. That's all I want to say. He goes, do you know who's Jabir Asarat al-Kiram? Do you know this person? He goes, yes, I do. The only person who know who's Jabir, it's me. He goes, who? She said, that's my husband. That's the man you put him in jail. He goes, your husband, the one who saved me, saved my finance? She said, yes. Then he go to the jail. And he take him out. He begged him to forgive him. He said, please, I don't even want the government. I'm going to take you right now to the Sultan because the Sultan told me, if you find out who is Jabir, bring him to me. I have to take you to the Sultan's office in, Dam in Damascus. And I have to tell him only, you deserve this office more than me. And please forgive me. And the man says, no, 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 I can't do that. You did what you have to do. But it shows you how the believers treated each other, how they trusted in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how they accept any rules come out from their mouth. You know, he could just scream, says, hey, I saved your life. Now we're putting me in jail. He didn't want to say that. Why? Because he did what he did for the sake purely, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, you didn't even tell me that was you. You could tell me, he goes, no, I want to do amal with ikhlas. I want to do this good deed, do it purely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, I use the money, the finance money of the government, but hey, that's what's for, to save the believers in trouble, life, uh, when they get in trouble, right? So he bring him to the Sultan and he tells the Sultan, I get you Jabir, this is a righteous man, this is a man who give sadaqat right and left. And I'm not going to take his place. I, there's no way I can replace the Imara. I am not going to take this position. Let it be him. But the other man, Akram, said, no, no, no. You, Khuzayma, you're better than me. You're one of the honorable people. I don't want you to, you know, if you fell down, the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, has hadith says, Akrimu aziz the qawmin zil. When a human being who has a very righteous position, and when they fall down into a hole, you have to honor them, 
you have to pick them up first because he's honorable man. You gotta keep them that position the way Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam kept the position of Abi Sufyan even before Abi Sufyan announced that he's a Muslim. He he called. He said, "Man dakhla dar Abi Sufyan, fa huwa Muslim, fa huwa Amin. Whoever enters the house of Abi Sufyan, they will be safe. We're not gonna bother them. We're not, we're not gonna kill them. They don't have to become Muslim." But uh, Abi Sufyan is a leader of Mecca. Keep that leadership for him and keep that position for him and let him feel like, wow, if they come to my house, they're still not gonna get killed even though they deserve to be killed, right? So uh, SubhanAllah, that's what made these people to come to Islam, the behavior, the, the akhlaq, the khuluq of Rasulullah Sallallahu who taught us. And this is the one when two people fighting, who's gonna take the position, it's not who's gonna take the position, but who's gonna push the position to the other person. And SubhanAllah, then the Khalifa was very happy and the Khalifa said, you know what? You both in charge in this position. You help each other to keep this beautiful religion to spread in a nice way. Anyway, Islam is spreading so fast. You need each other and go back and rule your own land with this beautiful uh, manner it's supposed to be, subhanAllah. That was the time of Al Khilafa Al Umawiya. And that's how uh, after this Khalifa, uh, Suleiman, Bin Abdul Malik, Khalifa Amr bin Abdul Aziz came. He inherited when he died to Amr bin Abdul Aziz. And the whole uh, people who study the history and the Khilafa, they said, Amr bin Abdul Aziz, they call Al Khilafa Al Rashidi Al Khamsa. Al Khulafa Al Rashidi means they ruled by wisdom. That's uh, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali. Then after that, it was no one ruled with such a justice like the very son of Suleiman bin Abdul Aziz, which is become Umar bin Abdul Aziz. Or, or that was his, his brother, uh, Suleiman, his brother the, of Umar bin Abdul Aziz. SubhanAllah. So that's why these stories were, give us a, a taste of an idea of the, the believers, whether in a power, powerful position as a political position or a powerful position as a finance man. They were honorable. They were trustworthy. They saved each other because they knew that they're not putting that money in a, in a wrong place. They knew that if, if he invests this 4,000 dinar in the hand of this Khuzayma, he will save so many people who they invested their money with Khuzayma and they were falling down, right? Losing the business together. So that's why the judgment of Akrama and he doesn't want anybody to know that he's doing the righteous good deed. You remember what the hadith says, Sabatun Yadullahum Allahu Fidullah Yamaladilla Illadullah, right? Seven types of people that will be under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the day of judgment when, when there is no shade but his shade. And one of them, Sadaqat Arajun to Sadaqa bi Sadaqatin Fahfaha, a man who give a charity in secret. Hatta la ta'ila ma yaminahu ma tinfaqsa shimalahu. The right hand don't know what the left hand spent or the left hand does not know what the right hand spent. And that was, uh, if it wasn't for his wife, nobody will know who is Jabir Atarat al-Kiram till today. SubhanAllah. Do you have room for one more story? Inshallah. Okay, I think we're fine. One more story. Okay, so everybody know who is Al Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, right? We're not gonna talk about his life. Uh, there is no way I can, you know, I have that no knowledge, no position to talk who is Al Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal. But we know he is the fourth of the fourth of Al Aima who preserves this beautiful religion. Uh, al al Abi Hanifa, Al Shafi'i, Al Al Maliki, then Al Hanbali, Ahmed bin Al Hanbal. That's his name, Ahmad bin Hanbal, Imam, the fourth Imam if, uh, in the Sunnah, right? Tradition. So where did he live? The era and the time was, he's from Baghdad. So he was a very knowledgeable person, remember? And he was, mashallah, has a lot of followers. His name reached all the land of the Muslimin in his time. And in his time when Islam was spreading, nobody met him in person, but the student of him will travel and they will say, we learn from our teacher, our teacher. That's why they start having schools later on. Now we call it the school of Ahmed bin Hanbal. We still have people who follow Al-Hanafi, Al-Shafi'i, Al-Hanbali, and uh, this is Al-Hanbali, okay, Ahmed bin Hanbal. 
So one day, what made them so, so great, l- listen to the story. One day he said he was looking and searching because they have to understand the seerah and the sunnah and the hadith. That's how they their school established. He's searching about one hadith, but he does not know if this hadith really how true the sanad. The, the sanad means it's not the body of the hadith, it's who narrated the hadith. He wants to know exactly if they were righteous people. So to me, one of them, he has to travel all the way from Baghdad to Damascus. So he found himself getting ready, preparing for uh, this trip. His son walked in, he said, where are you going? He goes, oh, I have to travel all the way to Damascus and uh, to find out this one hadith. I wanna use it, but I am not sure how true this hadith. Of course, the son tell him, dad, you're gonna travel all the way on the camel in this hot weather, right? From Baghdad all the way to Damascus, that's very far to walk, but that's how it is. He goes, Sahib al he goes, my, the one who seek knowledge and who seeks the truth, they, this is our jihad. I have to do what I have to do. I am not gonna just write a hadith. I am not sure about you know, the truth of this hadith. I have to travel, I have to do it. That's a way, that's a way. So he's coming now to Damascus, but in reality, this is her, his first trip. Nobody met him before. Nobody know him, even though his name is famous, right? So he traveled, he traveled, he traveled, he traveled. Finally, he arrived in Damascus at the middle of the night. Hey, no hotel. He doesn't know nobody. He can't say, come to the masjid or meet somebody say, hi, I am Imam bin Hanbal. Really? You are so famous. Everybody will fight over who's going to host him, right? But that's not the case. Nobody know him. So he come, he entered the masjid, and after he finished Isha pray and everybody leave, and he was so tired, he was so tired, he was so tired, he sat by this column of the masjid, and his eyes closing, he's about to sleep. So everybody was leaving the masjid, everybody left. Now the doorkeeper come and he said, hey, stranger, there's no, no way, this masjid is not a hotel, this masjid is not a place for anyone to sleep. Anyway, you're a stranger. We don't know who you are. Who you are. I can't let you. I, got, I have to lock the door. And that's the way they did once upon a time. You have to leave. He told him, please, let me just sleep here or stay here till Fajr. When Fajr come, you will be my witness. I'm just, just going to pray Fajr in the congregation. And then I will continue. I am here for a certain job. I'm just going to do what I have to do by the morning and leave the entire town. Please let me stay here. But the man was very aggressive. He came to me and said, I was assigned a job. My job is the doorkeeper. And they told me you cannot allow anyone to stay at night in the masjid. So you have to leave. So he started yelling at him. At that time, uh, one person was praying his sunnah or whatever. He, he heard that this doorkeeper is a little tough and aggressive on the stranger. And he went to him, he said, take it easy on him. He's a stranger. Well, that's not how we honor strangers. Don't you remember the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, he's a guest, he's our guest. We're gonna show him the honor, honorable. We're gonna treat him in a nice way. Let me take him to my house. Yes, he cannot sleep here, but hey, I'm not gonna leave the masjid and leave this man on the street. So he take him. He said, come follow me. He goes, Lenny, uh, if they just allow me to sleep here, I don't want to bother nobody. He said, don't worry. I'll take you and you have right to stay in my house three long days and night because that's a Rasul Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sunnah. You got to honor strangers. You're my guest. So he bring him home and he said, don't worry about it. I live by myself. My wife died. <clears throat> my only daughter I have married and she moved away. I live alone. So take your whatever you want to do. This is your room and this is my room. In the morning, we will go to Salat al-Fajr and we will do what we got to do. So the man was very happy. He never asked him, who are you? Where do you come from? No, no conversation such. So he goes to his room and he sleep. Then he hears the owner of the house. The, the man who's, you know, uh, the host praying uh, and while he's praying, he make dua. And every time he make dua, he started with the word Astaghfirullah al Oh God, I seek refuge in you. Then he did, he does his supplication. Oh, uh, you know, forgive my wife who died. Astaghfirullah al uh, You know, let my business flourish. He's a baker. Uh, then he say Astaghfirullah for everything he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his dua, 
He starts with the word Astaghfirullah al -Azim. So the Imam, Abi Hanbal, of course, he doesn't know who's he, right? So he just found it so little strange, little odd. Why this man, he always starts with the word Astaghfirullah al -Azim. So he got up and he come to his room. And when the man finished praying, he just, when he got up, he looked, he found his guest standing by the door. He said, oh my God, did I bother you? Did I disturb you? Is my voice was too loud for you? I should close my door. He goes, no, 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 no. But I was wondering why every time you make your dua, your beautiful dua, your salah, your qiyam, then so beautiful. He said, why you start by astaghfirullah al -Azim? You seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before you do. He goes, well, I just adopted this tradition because I know every time I want to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala something to give it to me, I have to replace something in that, that, oh my God, I, I come to you with my sin. Oh God, forgive all my sin, forgive me my sin. So I empty my sin by asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me. Then if Allah will give me, he will give it to me. He will answer my dua. But let me tell you, all the years I've been doing this way, every dua I ask for, it come true. Allah blessed me with such business. I am the only baker who's a very successful in this town. And people from far, they come and they buy bread, my bread, like a wholesale. I'm very, very, very happy to what I have. I think this is the key. So except one dua, I've been doing this dua for a long time and I am about to make that dua and this dua it did not happen yet. This, this question or this request, it did not happen yet. And the guest says, what is that? He goes, I've been making dua, oh Allah, give me the honor to meet Imam Abi Hanifa, uh, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal. This Imam, without him, I will be lost. He's guiding us, he's showing us, just like a scholar, like, right? He's a scholar. This is a scholar, without him, every time I go to the masjid, when the Imam speak, he said, our teacher, guided us in a certain way. He showed us the right path. He showed, He said, I've been making dua to have the honor to meet him in person before I die. This specific, specific request didn't happen yet. And I hope Allah will make it happen one day. I will go to Baghdad. You know what the man says? That is me. You are standing in front of Imam Hanbal. But I was too humble to tell you, and I was too humble to tell this man who Allah made this aggressive doorman to kick me out from the masjid, and you were there, and you begged me to come with you to stay in your house, as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pushed me, forced me to come and spend the three days and night in your house, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered your dua. SubhanAllah. I mean, you might look at the story, so what, right? It's just like somebody make dua, oh, Ya Rabbi, uh, you know, if, you know, one of the big scholars today, you wanna meet them in person. Don't you love to? That's why we go to conventions. That's why we go to the masajid. That's why we travel sometimes to meet so-and-so. And, and Alhamdulillah, we have a lot of, you know, uh, scholars who, who's alive today, Alhamdulillah. You know, we die, oh my God. Uh, you know, the first week I, I can't meet people ask me, did you see Umar Sulaiman? Did you see, uh, you know, uh, Allahumma salli al Nabi Yasir Qadi or uh, Naaman Khan, right? Because they're all in Dallas. <laughs> SubhanAllah, to see them in, in present and to be in their present, to be by their feet, uh, learning the knowledge from them directly, it's just like they are, you know, it's, it's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It, it's such an honor to be in person in front of those scholars. And this baker man, simple baker man, uh, he took care of this guest and he did not know even this guest was the great Imam, Imam uh, Ahmed bin Hanbal. With this story, I uh, end the night gathering, inshallah ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, give us the honor to be, the, you know, to be uh, uh, loved and be loved with the scholars of Islam. Inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will elect us with those great imams in Judgment Day with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honor us, all of us, to be under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the sake of the knowledge, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are gathering for. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the right way
to die in a righteous way. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us to remember, say astaghfirullah al-azim before you making any dua. As this man, this simple baker man uh, used to do it when it was his own supplication. Insha'Allah. Jazakumullah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you.